Uh, the way that I introduce relationalism uh, to my students and the way that I like to think about it is, as well um, is that uh, it's something somewhere in between uh, holism and individualism, where individualism everyone's more or less familiar with, or at least they, don't, they may not know that that's what, that's what they're doing and that's what most theories tend to be based on, um, is about capturing uh, the state, the sort of like the psychological state of the individual, or it's not, it could be, you know, a corporate actor as well, um, just before the moment of a decision in wherein different types of logics drive that individual's decision. So you have for your sort of standard methodological individualism, um, you have the rationalist approach in which it is about uh, an individual weighing a set of potential choices um, and thinking about information about probabilities and outcomes and making a choice that maximizes their utility. Um, what most uh, approaches don't get into is that a uh, certain amount of constructivist literature has a similar type of model in that what it's thinking about, or at least part of the constructivist model, is that it's about reconstructing the psychological state of the individual just prior to the decision, except that in the decision calculus isn't uh, what, how can I maximize my utility, uh, but a series of questions. Uh, who am I in this situation? What is the appropriate behavior for me in this situation? And then uh, carrying out whatever the appropriate thing is. Uh, both these are individualist approaches. Um, there's a part of the constructivist uh, theory that also in, engages in, in sort of structural or holism that tells us why an individual might think that they, um, uh, how they, how they get socialized into these norms in the first place. But both of these accounts have in common uh, the fact that what they're, they're saying is, well, we can explain individual action either by some sort of a logic, by some sort of logic, internal logic, uh, which they carry out in a given situation. That's your sort of standard individualist approach, and it can be either constructivist or rationalist. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum is the uh, holist approach, um, wherein there is an external structure which enables and constrains uh, individuals, again, in individual units, whatever they, they are, um, restricts the, gives them uh, in the first place a set of, of options and gives them some sort of uh, ecological uh, pressures in order to choose certain types of strategies over other types of strategies. So. Uh, again, there's a, a sort of a rationalist and uh, constructivist uh, variants of this in that the rationalist uh, variant is sort of exemplified by uh, writers like uh, Waltz or, or Mearsheimer who talk about how the international system um, in terms of the number of great powers, the distribution of material um, capabilities across those enables constraints in those uh, great powers to act in certain types of ways through balancing and bandwagoning or in Mearsheimer's case going for it uh, for the uh, offensive variant. Uh, but action is not explained by the individual units but by the sort of overall structure across uh, an entire system. Um, the constructivist variant of course is that uh, we live in is uh, exemplified by, by Wendt in that we live in uh, different types of cultures of anarchy and that these cultures tell us what is appropriate behavior uh, by individual units, in that case states, um, under different types of, of anarchies, how they're supposed to respond uh, to different types of, of stimuli from other states, um, you know, with the culture of anarchy um, determining what the appropriate behavior is. So uh, relationalism is something in between these two uh, approaches in that uh, the instead of saying well we need to sort of reconstruct this psychological thing going on inside individuals minds or having this very uh, top-down approach to uh, saying something about what how uh, individual units are affected by structure instead it takes uh, a, a middle ground approach and that it looks at uh, interactions between uh, individual units as both the source of structure and the kind of action uh, we are attempting to explain. And there's some big benefits from this. Um, from the, um, in contrast to individualism, you get this, uh, you can actually observe the things which you're trying to explain, right? You, you're observing the, the actions and the actions 
uh, themselves are explained uh, via a variety of approaches. And, and network approaches are just one way of, uh, one relationalist way of trying to explain um, uh, action. Uh, and it, it doesn't rely on some sort of unobserved quantities going on. You can observe the pre existing sets of relations. Uh, as a way of trying to explain uh, the action of individual units. And on the structure side, it gives you a much more nuanced approach to structure, and that it's not just this single overwhelming structure uh, across an entire system, which more or less treats units identically. Uh, instead, the structure which individual units observe is based instead on uh, the sort of totality of all of the uh, sets of relations in which they're in, embedded and depending upon your structural position in these where we have sort of very archetypal uh, structural uh, structural positions uh, which are both sort of constructivist and, uh, and and rationalist and this is an important thing to keep in mind that relationalism isn't one or the other that you need the content of the ties which are going to enable and constrain uh, individual actors can be material ties or uh, they can be uh, social ties, uh, ideational ties, um, uh, things like that. And so based on essentially the sum of your past and current interactions uh, informs you as to, uh, and the, the position that you have vis-a-vis -vis a variety of different actors is what is going to enable and constrain you. Again, it's more sort of a structural approach to, in, to take actions uh, af afterwards. So, uh, I mean, I come at, at this from a, a network approach, a networks approach. Um, there are many different types, other ways of approaching this, which don't involve, you know, the, the sort of the, uh, not necessarily quantitative, but the, the idea that, that we, we want to look at, at networks. Some of them are a little more individual centered. Um, some of them focus not on the units, but on say scripts uh, and ideas. So it, it, it follows the uh, specific sorts of uh, norms, ideas, uh, standards, scripts, et cetera, uh, from, from place to place. Um, but what I tend to focus on uh, in, in my own work is uh, thinking about uh, enduring repeated uh, deep sets of ties between actors and how uh, that is that it, it enables and constrains and, and shapes uh, their behavior. So uh, networks is one way of being relationalist, but it's not the, it's not the only one. A traditional focus on power would might give you some. So let's just go back to sort of the structural realist perspective. So um, you know, power comes essentially by measuring the capabilities of state versus each other. So the unit characteristic, which you then uh, sort of compare in order to uh, assess relative power, or at least power potential power capabilities. Right? There's all 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 sorts of questions about actually implementing these in practice, um, which may or may not uh, happen. So. Uh, instead, uh, what you think of as uh, power in the more relational or more specific in the, in the network sense uh, is the ability to act along or engage with or use uh, these existing sets of more or less enduring permanent um, uh, and deep ties in order to mobilize groups of actors uh, in order to take some sorts of to take some sorts of actions which are commensurate with the existing types of uh, ideas which you have and so if it's the, the constructivist variant uh, you would enable your you would uh, you would enable your networks in order to achieve goals which are commensurate with your identity which your identity is based on uh, your position in a set of sort of uh, sets of ties so uh, simplest explanation right in the classroom is that you know that the professors and students we are co-constituting each other um, and that it's not that we we have these roles it's not that we sort of have these in our head we do have these in our heads but the way that uh, the way that these are created and maintained is through interactions and following of scripts where whereby the professor at least in some locations gets up and lectures and the students hopefully take notes um, uh, as, as a result of that. And so power in this sense is going to be, uh, is exerted by virtue of the professor's position vis-a-vis -vis the students as the knowledge giver, at least in, in theory. Um, and so is exerting power by spreading ideas through the network, which is created uh, through the classroom and specific classrooms and then sort of, well, I guess we don't have classrooms anymore, but 
uh, at least in many places, we don't have classrooms, but we, we are going to have classrooms and we'll see how that works out. Um, but that uh, it's, and then it's the sort of the, the superset of all of these interactions with all kinds of professors and then further interactions between students who are spreading on the knowledge which is spread by the professors. So power here um, isn't necessarily, I mean, it, you can fit into it, it in, into sort of the material or, or realist uh, type of, of, of power uh, as well. The power here is more uh, in the sense of getting things done uh, than it is the sort of traditional dominance types of powers. You can also do dominance uh, pretty easily. And I'm just, um, you know, realist examples have to do with activation of networks in order to create or maintain uh, alliances uh, among states uh, when you have, when you're in some sort of a, a, a conflictual situation uh, in order to assemble some sort of a, uh, a coalition or to uh, convince states not to in, engage uh, in, in ties with other states in order to produce a, a preponderance of power, uh, military, sort of military power through uh, your various connections uh, in order to achieve uh, whatever ends it is that you wish to achieve uh, using your, your, your material power, which would probably have something to do with maintaining that material power, at least if you're a, a strict uh, uh, structural rule. So of course, all, all kinds of different foreign policy goals, which one can attempt to maintain uh, through those through those things. So, yeah. So it it depends upon uh, what sort of theory um, idea of anarchy you, you, you buy into. I mean, I uh, you know how I like to, to think about it um, is that anarchy anarchy is is an assumption and all of the interesting and and you know that it's not something that that one agrees or, or or disagrees with, right? It's a it's a stylized fact of, about about the world that there is a lack of central authority. Um, but what networks get gets you, um, or relational approaches in, in general, and networks in, in particular, uh, uh, gets you is that instead of thinking about it um, in say the structural realist terms again, you know, where you have either anarchy or hierarchy, and because you don't have hierarchy, you therefore have anarchy. Um, it lets you think. Um, in an interesting way about uh, embedded hierarchies within anarchy, um, which are created and maintained through these uh, various types of networks and relations uh, between different, uh, not just states, but other, other types of, of, of entities. Um, and how, um, and so uh, scholars who, who, who think about um, these sort of, how these hierarchies within an anarchy often are taking uh, relational or network approaches, even if they don't know if that's 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 what, what they're doing, because uh, in order to try to determine, say, the overall uh, overall international hierarchies within that, you would we would need to look at all the different types of ties and relationships and power relationships, right? Because hierarchy is ultimately about power uh, between different types. Uh, of, of states. So uh, I haven't really been in, involved in this uh, particular sort of hierarchy versus um, anarchy uh, debate or discussion or, or whatever it is that, that we might, might characterize it, uh, sort of the general, more general problem of, of international order. Um, but that, but the, the uh, you know, I, I think that, that again, it's sort of a, a, there's a clear advantage of taking a relational approach. Um, to this kind of question because uh, when you get away from like, you know, the extremes of anarchy and hierarchy, um, what you really are talking about is some sort of a, a structure, which isn't like a single overwhelming monolithic structure, the kind of fullest structure, but what, you're, what, you, what you really wanna say is, okay, well, what exactly is the structure or set of structures uh, in international uh, relations? And the answer to that in part seems to have to do with, um, you know, really tracing uh, different sets of, of relations in order to say, okay, this is what the uh, structure and therefore the hierarchy uh, looks like. The, the quantitative qualitative uh, sort of uh, distinction is, is, is actually, it is, is, is actually, I would say, more useful here than it is in, in some places in that there, right, there, there is a, a very distinct um, you know, set of people who uh, try to go out and measure in some way, uh, more or less, um, you know, set, sets of ties. And, and the, the great thing about international relations and the reason why it, everyone should be a relationist is because it is all about, it is all about relations. 
Um, and there are so, I mean, there's so many incredibly dense data sets which people have already collected, which are networks, um, you know, alliances, trade, diplomatic relations, uh, militarized disputes are, are a network, economic sanctions are practically any kind of interesting action um, has or is likely to have some network characteristics. By network characteristics, I mean that each and every, so it normally, and this is part of the, the problem that for a long time there was this approach, at least on the quantitative side, to looking at the dyad, right? Two states um, having some sort of interaction. Um, and the problem is that the methodological, both methodologically and also theoretically, um, there wasn't a whole lot of very sophisticated thinking about how uh, one you know, one dyadic choice or one interaction is going to be highly dependent on another interaction uh, at the same time, right? So there were some people who were working on like, okay, so if this happens in the previous time period and this other thing happens over here, like you can actually kind of model that even within the dyadic, uh, your traditional large end dyadic regression structure. Um, the thing that networks, the network approach gets you uh, to this particular uh, question or, or um, is that it allows you, or at least the most sophisticated types of network modeling tools allow you to say, okay, we think that actually there's going to be network dependencies at the same, in the same time period that between A and B and B and C, even though these are happening in the same time period, uh, we can model the fact that these are actually, these choices are going to be dependent on each other with a variety of different types of network mechanisms, um, you know, sort of, uh, popularity or closing triangles or a friend of my friend, uh, is my friend or the enemy of my enemy is my friend or different types of mechanisms like that we can actually observe many of these um, uh, and and model them uh, in ways that are simply impossible in your traditional regression regression framework and that your traditional regression framework on the quantitative side uh, at least uh, has this you know individual um, as the IAD assumption which just isn't true right that these observations are not independent of, of each other and that and the argument, of course, from the networks, at least the quantitative networks community, is that we need to be modeling these dependencies uh, rather than trying to assume them, them away. Uh, that's sort of on the on the on the quantitative. So there's a lot of people who um, now there are you know like every any kind of quantitative um, study, it, this does require a number of uh, underlying assumptions about what exactly the units are, right? Uh, so. And this is one uh, potential problem with taking a network approach is that at least a quantitative network approach is that most of the data that we're going to have are between you know, existing major units that are created uh, in part because they create data, uh, right? So international organizations and states are you know, statistical en entities, statistical entities in the sense that they create the statistics and the numbers in the first place, which we uh, would, would like to measure. So there's a, a massive uh, amount of, of bias in terms of like the kinds of phenomena that you're going to look at uh, if you want to take a, a that kind of, of quantitative approach. Now there are some ways, there's a lot of ways of getting around that and lots of data sets that people are making now which aren't, aren't necessarily reliant on these and it's actually one of the most I think promising um, applications of these sort of these sort of uh, you know massive event coders which take uh, headlines or newspaper articles or parts of newspaper articles and then turn them into interactions. Um, it does have the same kind of problem that you do need, uh, you often need some sort of a dictionary and then the dictionary itself is going to be biased, of course, because uh, you're, you're the one who's putting in like the states and the organizations and, you know, the verbs and, uh, as well as, as the nouns in, in, in the first place. Nonetheless, this is still uh, a broad shortcoming in that you have to uh, make, you have to start with some assumptions about what exactly are the characteristics of the ties and what are the nodes. Uh, what are the individual units? Um, and this is where other relationalist approaches uh, and, and non-quantitative network approaches uh, can really um, uh, have, have a clear advantage in that you don't necessarily have to go in assuming uh, units and relations. Um, so more qualitative approaches um, instead can, can ask questions about, you know, what, what, what constitutes uh, these units in the first place. Uh, looking, if you're looking at a particular set of, of phenomena, you can be looser about what what types of actors you're going to take into account. Right, so you can sort of aggregate across different types of levels. It can be individuals. It can be different types of groups, not just these sort of formal organizations, uh, which the quantitative network 
uh, approaches tend to uh, tend to focus on. Um, it's also uh, the network approach isn't very conducive to say if what you're really interested in are uh, the creation of sets of scripts and practices. Like where do practices come from in the first place and how do they evolve? Um, you can have a sort of a network-ish approach to it, thinking about the diffusion of these types of things or the possibilities for action by individual uh, units in order to create or destroy ties um, uh, and how that ends up sort of affecting the, the, the creation or, or diffusion of scripts. Uh, but you can't really get into some of the really interesting stuff which has to do with um, how actors uh, and, and groups and uh, you know sort of create these uh, the, the content in, in the first place and in fact create uh, create the units um, right because you know when you think about say epistemic communities right to, which sort of an old old old, old war horse here but um, you know you measuring you know you an epistemic community is inherently right it's an imagined community like all other imagined communities including states um, such that it's uh, you can't really sort of you know uh, the creation of the units the imagined community in the first place you can't really get at that very successfully through a network approach you need to think about it more through um, sort of an, an on the ground interpretivist uh, type of approaches, you know, what is the understanding of the actors and groups as they create and spread uh, these ideas and scripts in the first place about what constitutes uh, what con constitutes the, the, the group it, itself. Um, uh, so, you know, taking uh, taking an ethnographic approach to networks um, or to to relations, right, um, can be uh, it, it, you know very valuable uh, in this context. starting sort of at the very top level which is um, sort of where people tend to think about uh, international networks um, has to do with uh, essentially types of usually material though often uh, as I would argue that it's, it's actually the, uh, the, the ideas and the organization um, and the, the the tacit knowledge which is being if you can transmit it um, which is really important uh, between different types of states so um, whether this uh, assistance comes in the form of uh, so the the categories um, uh, Matt Cranig, uh, right uh, identified a number of what he called sensitive nuclear assistance, which is uh, assistance uh, with plutonium reprocessing or uranium enrichment, or uh, with uh, or weapons design uh, being transmitted in between states. This very specific you know sensitive assistance network uh, is actually pretty. Uh, sparse. It hasn't been that many countries, it's around, you know, uh, 30 sort of dyads in, in total who have provided this specific kind of assistance, which uh, should have been obvious to everyone that this is probably for nuclear weapons purposes, not just because they really want to reprocess plutonium um, for what, for what, whatever reasons. And, and this isn't just um, countries that have nuclear weapons, right, because there are countries that have, do have these, these technologies. Um, you know, Germany and, and Japan, uh, neither of whom have really provided a whole lot of assistance. There was one point in which Germany was going to help Brazil, but uh, most of that didn't actually uh, end up being transmitted. So the uh, idea here is that, uh, which is correct, which is that no nuclear weapons project is a national project. It's always an international project. And this is true going all the way back to Manhattan Project, um, which had a massive uh, number of foreign scientists who were working on uh, the project, um, uh, you know, the United States was uh, was the the, the benefit, you know, benefited immensely um, from uh, from the you know from Nazi Germany essentially uh, causing all of the best, not all of them, but most of the best scientists to flee uh, to elsewhere. So there's there's the scientists, uh, but there's also um, there was also sort of transmission of knowledge and and even materials between multiple different so, um, you know, the United Kingdom's program started first, uh, and then essentially ended up more or less sort of, you know, sort of uh, assisting the U.S. program. Uh, the uranium from that was used in order to uh, either enrich in the case of uh, a little boy or uh, put into reactors and create plutonium in the case of a fat man. Is that um, 
that the, there was materials flow, the uh, movement of people, which you know essentially is, is knowledge flow uh, in the U.S. program. This sort of idea the U.S. did it alone. It's like it's it's entirely um, you know that 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 many of the main scientists uh, who worked on on the project uh, came from from foreign countries. And when you look at the history of every program after that, there has been some sort of transmission of something, whether it is through um, movement of people or through espionage or active assistance uh, in terms of either knowledge or technologies or materials, um, that there is in fact a, a, an extensive network uh, connecting all these countries uh, that attempt to, and some of which succeed, um, getting nuclear weapons. Uh, the interesting spin that I have on this, of course, is that the materials and technology don't really matter that much. Uh, the thing that really matters is when you have uh, assistance with the knowledge and the organization, when you have actual teams of people going from one place uh, to another in order to provide direct assistance, and then it even depends upon whether they're assisting them in the right way. So uh, the massive the assistance from Soviet Union to China, uh, for example, was mostly material and turned out by, uh, I know people who've like tried to reconstruct it, um, turns out not to have affected the timing of the Chinese program at all. This is in part because the Soviet Union, you know, cut off assistance part of the way through and then left with a number of the important parts uh, and say lubricants, which were, which were required for the gas diffusion program. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, the Chinese complained constantly that the Soviets weren't actually giving them what they really wanted, which was, and they had promised them, which is a prototype of a bomb and then a, a full set of, you know, essentially lectures um, and, you know, access directly to scientists in order to talk about uh, how it was created and the assumptions that went into it and why they made certain decisions uh, and, and, and not others. Um, and the sort of knowledge transmission problem, uh, I argue at least, is one of the main reasons why you haven't, that despite these uh, fairly dense networks and moving of technology and materials, uh, that a lot of this assistance uh, really hasn't helped countries um, all, all that much. And uh, the, my, the, my, my favorite example actually is, uh, is, is domestic uh, transmission from when they who created Livermore uh, National Laboratory in the, in, the, in the first place, right? So ideal conditions, scientists from the previous laboratory uh, went there, rich country, uh, had already designed nuclear weapons, and the first two weapons were physics, right? They, they, they didn't work. Now there is some debate over whether this is because they were trying a specific type of uh, design, which Ed Teller was like really, really, really wanted to, to try out, and that's why uh, it failed to even destroy the Chot Tower. So that's what the Los Alamos scientist told the New Livermore scientists that um, you know they, they would like to borrow their Shot Tower after they, you know, the, the next time uh, after after they use it, since it wouldn't be destroyed. Um, but the the the, the, the the broader point that this point is that, is that knowledge transmission uh, and creation of the knowledge, which is ta the tacit knowledge, which is required, not the explicit knowledge, which can be written down, blueprints and things like that. Um, uh, that's really difficult to transmit and has been one of the fortunate reasons why we haven't seen more proliferation. Um, uh, is that a lot of this assistance hasn't, hasn't helped very much. There's, there's a broader set of assistance categories having to do with civilian um, sort of peaceful civilian, whatever it is you want to call it, nuclear assistance, um, has to do with help with uh, building nuclear power plants in particular, and this is a, a big concern now. Many countries in the energy, you know, energy rich Middle East uh, who are flaring off natural gas, which is horrible for the environment and, uh, and as, as well as, as, as wasteful, um, and then say, oh, no, no we, we, need, we need nuclear power for our power efforts, and, and no one thinks this is actually true. Part of the problem, though, is that the actual links between civilian nuclear reactors, you know, the, the sort of knowledge and techniques and all that, the, the, there is a big disconnect between that and actually developing um, nuclear weapons that it's been very, uh, that, the, that there, there's, there's so many intermediate steps that this, I think, is better sort of seen as more of a signaling or, um, or a, a sort of maybe deep ground uh, preparation of trying to uh, train up a bunch of people. In which case, the most important thing is something that many countries have done at the beginning of the nuclear programs, that they sent a ton of scientists abroad uh, to go study 
uh, nuclear engineering, right? So the, the important networks here, I guess is the overall thing which I'm trying to say, is not the material systems from, from state to state. Uh, it's tracking the flow of knowledge, which essentially is tracking the flow of people uh, from, from, from place to place. So that's the sort of the, the, very, the very international and transnational level. You can get all the way down um, to the more uh, local level in terms of the importance of networks and creating uh, nuclear weapons when you think about it. So the, the most hyper-local thing you can think of is in terms of design teams. So there is, uh, along with so many different, um, I mean, you can see this everywhere, right? There's this sort of idea of the, of the, lone, the lone designer, like there's the, the brilliant individual who uh, designs a, a weapon. Um, the thing is, is that it's, 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 simply, it's simply not the case. Like there is a, a lead, like there's a, and someone in charge of it, but it's a team of people who are working together. Um, and especially with thermonuclear weapons, which you have a primary and a secondary, and these are different people who are, work, who are, are designing it. And you have engineers who are also involved in it. Um, and it, it has to do with like the intensity, the density, intensity, and the quality of interaction between all these people, um, which is going to be more likely to, to determine whether a given project is going to succeed or not, um, and that you need the, the particular types of high quality networks. That's the data which I would really like to, to get my, my, uh, my hands on, but I haven't quite figured out a way of doing so uh, in an unclassified uh, manner. But, you can, but the, the, the point is here is that you can think of networks both on a macro scale and a micro scale about like the real action has to do with the interactions uh, between uh, groups uh, rather than it necessarily uh, being instead of focusing so much on individual countries or individual designers or individual whatevers um, in, in the process. Now we need to, to think about um, how knowledge is created, stored, and, and transmitted, and that some of that knowledge isn't just in the heads of individuals, it's in the collective knowledge of the team and teams that work together um, in order to try to produce outcomes. So if you can think about this, there's five million sports ball analogies, right? So basketball teams, football teams, um, teams that work closely together know that, right, that, that in, in some cases, as we know, that, that the sum is, is often greater than the individual, or sometimes it's less than the, than the individual uh, players because the really important knowledge about how to act together as a team is not just, I mean, trivially it's in the individual players' heads, but really, in terms of all of these practices which they developed through literally practicing uh, in order to produce a team dynamic uh, which produces the outcome which they're looking for. Or in the case of many teams, uh, produce a pathological outcome. So this is why you know you get a team of superstars and they do terribly. Um, it's because they're, they're all acting as individuals, they're not acting, they haven't created, they haven't had the chance to uh, practice together and create the tacit knowledge of working with each other uh, in order to be able to achieve uh, collective team goals. So instead of thinking about uh, networks in terms of like, well, it, you know, it's something a part starts in Germany and ends up in, in Brazil or whatever it, it may happen to be, but looking at the actual supply chains, like where do, where do these physical objects go? Where do they go in between? And this is a particularly important course in the case of uh, smuggling and, and clandestine and, and black market networks. So, um, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you like the case for, and then I'll give you I'll give you the the, the, the case against this this being a, a an important phenomenon at least in terms of nuclear proliferation. It's actually more important in terms of proliferation of uh, systems which can be more easily decomposed into parts or or the individual parts um, can you can work on individual parts of the system separately with and make some assumptions about the rest of the system as opposed to the more the, the, a, a system which has to be tightly integrated and is, is tightly coupled, uh, like, like nuclear weapons. Um, so um, so the, 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 the case for is that, uh, is looking at things like, like the AQCon network, um, which, um, you know, created because there were certain parts that either could not be or at least or arguably could be uh, could not be created in Pakistan or could be uh, created more efficiently um, elsewhere. Um, and one of the reasons why the Khan network, Khan could go and sell all of these things to different places is that he had already created an international network of suppliers 
for certain types of individual parts. And all I needed to do was just have him create more parts and send them somewhere else other than his own. So his own, uh, his own sort of international smuggling network, although a lot of it was sort of above board because some of the, uh, well, some of the parts were not, um, are, are not necessarily subject, or if they're subject to dual use controls and they aren't in the countries which you go to, which is part of the whole, whole problem of, of trying to uh, keep the, the, tech, the, the tech genie uh, in, in, in the bottle. Um, the, the point is, is, that, uh, is that it is possible to outsource production of things to elsewhere and create a, and create a, a network uh, in order to pull in these types of uh, whatever components it is that, that, that you need. Um, two words of caution on this. One is that it's a, it's a non-network network. If you, if you look at individual countries' procurement networks, what it really is, it's just a bunch of point-to-point -point transactions. Uh, there's no network qualities to it in that there's no network properties. Um, there's, you don't get transitivity. You, you don't get, um, well, so sometimes, sometimes you will actually get concentration. So, uh, you know, Malaysia turned out to be a place which many different countries uh, went to in order to create certain parts for their for their uh, their centrifuges. So I guess you could think of that as a as a popularity, um, but that it it doesn't have these kinds of uh, these collective interactive effects that you would normally see uh, in 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 most networks. And part of the reason for that is because they're clandestine, right? That you're trying to make each one of these transactions separate from all the other transactions, and for uh, and to try to keep people from, when you try to keep your network secret, uh, it means that your network can't actually act as a network, uh, a network form of organization uh, is, is how, you know, we can think of it in terms of the organizational, um, organizational paradigm. The networks which are created uh, in the clandestine networks are often very inefficient in that they cannot work, the different nodes can't work collaboratively specifically because they're trying to cut them off from each other. Now, in the case of networks like uh, you know how empires are ruled, sort of the divide, you, you want to keep them separate, and this is very efficient because you don't want them working with each other. You want to break up the networks, but in the case of you know sort of supplier networks, you want them to work with each other because when you have problems, you need to troubleshoot them, you need to get back to them. Um, these sort of clandestine third-party uh, types of relationships are actually terrible. Uh, at that kind of problem. So if you have a problem with your third party source centrifuges, um, you know, which went through three different points in order to get to you, it's really difficult to get back to them in the first place. So it's sort of, uh, you know, I'm already getting into the critique part. So the, the, the problem here is that, um, you know, uh, this nuclear Walmart, which has been referred to um, by a couple people, the director of the IAEA at the time called it that, it's more like, uh, a, a nuclear used car dealership, but it's like the worst used car dealership ever, and that you can't even go back to it if you get a lemon, like it disappears, it goes somewhere else. Um, you know, they're selling used centrifuges, low miles. My grandmother used it to enrich uh, uranium in, in her garage, you know, only on Sundays kind of thing. Um, but then actually going and finding that, that contact again uh, becomes difficult. And this is actually what Pakistan did. A lot of the parts which they sold to other countries directly, right? Not through the indirect procurement network uh, were used or broken ones, which they had decided to stop using because they tended to break. Um, so this is, this is one of the great things about, this is one of the, the, the great and sort of ironic non-proliferation stories about the assistance that Pakistan gave to Iran is that Iran ended up going in big on the P1 centrifuge, which, um, which was a terrible centrifuge. Like it was, uh, it was the design which lost a design competition in Europe to two other centrifuges. And so the Dutch never made it. And that's the one the AQCon stole, and they made a bunch of them and discovered that it was terrible, and then sold the plans and the, and the used parts to Iran, which is one of the reasons why Iran took so long to actually get their centrifuges up and working, uh, which is why there was a possibility for an Iran deal, but never mind that. Um, so this is this sort of the, the flip side of that is that, yeah, you can, and there are certain types of things that they're, they're common, um, I don't require a lot of sophistication. You can outsource those to other places, but there are going to remain uh, specific precision unique components, uh, which you need a lot of quality control over, and you simply can't get that through these uh, clandestine fly-by-night used car dealership uh, types of transactions. 
Well, I mean, classification is, uh, I think, the, 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 the biggest issue in that, um, in that, in that governments don't, there's lots of things which, which are classified, and, and if scholars had knowledge of them, we could have a much more complete picture of, of, of exactly what's going on or, or where, where different parts are moving or which, or which thing is most important. I mean, there's been a lot of really good open source and declassified work on this. Um, and especially with sort of on the open source imagery uh, uh, front, the uh, gigantic leaps in you know, commercial satellites have enabled a lot of this open source stuff to do things that the, that the US that governments really can't in that they have like these, in that open source, they have these large networks of people who are working together collaboratively, looking at all these images and trying to identify them. So um, that's, that's sort of a, a big positive in terms of the, the prediction or at least the, the assessment um, in that you do have the sort of the, the same benefits you have with open source software is that you have many eyes looking at it and working with each other and having conversations about about this sort of uh, open source uh, open source intelligence. Um, I, I think that, that the many of the, the challenges um, that here have to do with these um, with the uh, Right. The, the, the advantage of the network form of organization or trying to move things through clandestine networks is that um, is that you're taking something which already was difficult to track and making it even more uh, unobservable. Um, and so the difficulty here is with getting getting the data in the first place, like to, to really analyze the structure and form, uh, the structure slash form and content uh, of a network has such high data requirements and missing the fact that missing data is crucially, can be crucially important to the kinds of conclusions that you draw from it, especially depending upon what types of metrics and measures um, it is that you're trying to, uh, you're, you're trying to get at, um, uh, means that many of the conclusions listed with your sort of quantitative network analysis due to the high likelihood of missing data, especially with clandestine slash classified slash both types of transactions. Uh, if you're just missing a few transactions, you may be missing the, the whole picture, which is why you have to be very careful, especially with the quantitative work, because um, that's going to be uh, most affected by, oh, it turns out that there's a link between A and B and we didn't know about it, which actually undermine, could undermine a lot of analysis depending upon the types of metrics that you're using in order to measure something. So if you're looking at centrality, say, just degree centrality, like the number of ties you have to other countries, not affected, or units, not affected very much by the addition of a, another node. But um, between the centrality, in which you're saying, okay, that one individual is a broker and therefore very powerful and very important um, because there are gaps elsewhere in the network, if it turns out that in fact there wasn't a gap in the network, that the, that the missing tie which you didn't measure um, reshapes that entirely, it can massively throw off your types, your, your quantitative measures. So you have to be very careful uh, about making conclusions about uh, diff certain types of measures, which even though they get at the concepts they're really interested in, like brokerage and power that comes from that, um, that those types of measures can be very sensitive if you're just missing uh, a few observations. And this is less of a problem for things, large data sets of very observable things like international trade, um, uh, but it can be a problem with uh, you know, trying to look at smaller networks of of, uh, of individuals. Um, so, I'll just say one one last thing, but which has to say is that there's an inherent trade-off in between uh, a network's ability to transmit or or you know have flows uh, and its resiliency to attack from other places. Um, so this is a thing which is often missed in uh, studies of uh, clandestine transnational actors. Um, is that you know the, the advantage of the cell structure uh, that we think of in the terrorist cell structure? Um, the advantage is, is that it's very difficult to trace the cells back to the main body of the organization. But the flip side of that is that you have very few conduits under which to transmit uh, sort of knowledge and resources, um, and which means that very complex tasks which require a, a very high degree of coordination among a large number of people can't be done through this kind of form of organization, which is why, even though there's sort of like, ooh, networks, they're out there, they're scary, it's like, well, there are major disadvantages to organizing uh, and having a relatively sparse network, um, the network form of organization, uh, and then that flip side can actually undermine uh, whatever it is that you're uh, attempting to do in the first place.